Uh, just a, a comment. We're going to have four weeks in the, um, in the book of Ephesians. And, uh, but, but right in the middle of those four weeks, uh, which is January 30th, we're going to have a, a, a taco night. We're calling it a family taco night. And what that means, it does not mean that you need to have 2.3 children and a wife and a husband to come. It means Rancho Christian Center is family. And if you come here, you are a part of the family. So um, come, uh, you've seen all the information, how much everything is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're planning, uh, really, it's just really hanging out together, having a meal together, which is really great fun. Uh, uh, we have a, a special singer uh, going to sing a song for us, one of our young ones. And I think we'll probably have a couple of, uh, maybe a couple songs of worship. And uh, it'll be a very, very uh, uh, low-key, casual evening. So uh, come plan for that January 30th, 6 o'clock. Uh, be here. We'll, we'll have a great time together. Pray it doesn't rain that time. I hate to ever pray that it doesn't rain uh, because we need rain in California. Uh, how many of you know that rain is a blessing? It's a blessing of the Lord. Um, uh, a drought... Uh, is a curse. It's not an atmospheric uh, issue. Drought is a curse. And, you know, we've had a lot of droughts here, and, and I'd still pray unto him, God, lift the curse. Give us what we don't deserve in California. Give us rain. So, Father, thank you for the rain that you're giving us. And open up the word to us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Um, I first have just a, uh, as we're entering into the book of Ephesians, uh, for the next four weeks, um, do you have that, uh, that map slide? I just kind of want to give you a, a, a picture of where we are at. As you'll notice, I, I've been really, I've been dying to use this thing for years. And so it's a special night to me, so just bear with me. Uh, Ephesus, that's where this book was written to. You'll see other places where, uh, where we have books in the Bible where there was churches in the early church. Uh, Ephesus being where Turkey is now, Philippi. Uh, Corinth, First uh, and Second Corinthians, the book of Philippians on the Greek mainland. Uh, Athens, you see here, you read about in the book of Acts where, where Paul was just, he was just vexed because they had so many idols in the city. And uh, he was there for just a bit. Uh, Colossians um, is right, right around in here, Colossae, uh, the city. And this region here, we have one book that's to a region and not a city. Uh, the book of Galatians is to the region of Galatia, which is right here, in through this area here. So we see the ministry of where, where Paul was and where this book was written to the church that was in Ephesus. So if you have your Bibles, which I really hope you did tonight because it's a Bible study, and uh, it's really cool if you have them, um, we're going to open up into the book of Ephesians tonight, chapter 1. Wave at me if you have it. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, begins with this. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul identifies himself first off as the writer and those he's writing to, the church of Ephesus. Not every book of the Bible is so clear who the writer is, and who the recipients are. But in this book, it's very, very clear. And the, the, the book of Ephesians has been given an awful lot of, an awful lot of wonderful names, you know, the, the Grand Canyon of Scripture, because of its depth and so much that is in it. It's had many wonderful accolades, and we'll, we'll see how far we get in the coming weeks uh, regarding it, but it is a great book for Christian living. How should I live my life as a Christian? It is not a book full of theories. It's a book of, of how-tos, and so it's very, very important to the, to the believer to go through the book of Ephesians. You'll remember from the book of Acts that Paul, who was originally called Saul, did all he could to destroy the church. You remember when, when Stephen when Stephen was stoned, Paul was there in complete agreement, holding the coats of those who were, were uh, uh, a part of that. And so he, he hated the early church. He did all that he could do to destroy the church until 
we read in Acts chapter 9, you're not going to turn to it, until he had uh, an important uh, event take place in his life. He was so angry, so full of murderous threats, that he went to Damascus uh, with letters from the, the religious leaders in Jerusalem to bring back the Christians in chains, throw them in prison, and uh, uh, if they were killed along the way, that'd be fine with him too, because he, he, he really felt he was doing the right thing. You know, you can feel you're doing the right thing and still be doing the wrong thing. If it's not led by the Spirit of God, you could be doing the wrong thing thinking all the time that you're right on the mark. This was Paul. But he had a dramatic conversion in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, he's riding on his horse or whatever it was to Damascus. Suddenly there's a bright light. He's thrown off of his horse. He hears a voice from heaven. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he replies and says, who are you, Lord? He knows that something's up here. He's no fool. Who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Now, Paul didn't know Jesus. Paul didn't uh, uh, ever throw Jesus into What did he mean by that? The, the point is this. There are those who would say, I love Jesus, I just don't like the church. I love Jesus, but I want no part of those people. There is a connection, and Jesus shows it in Acts chapter 9, when he says, you're persecuting me, you persecute the church, that's my body. You're persecuting me, the head. If you take yourself and you remove your head from your body, your head and your body are going to die. Now, if you try to remove Jesus from his church, the church dies. Jesus will still continue to go on, but there's a, a relationship together. He is the head. He is the direction. We as pastors, as best we know how, are taking direction from the head. We're not the head. Jesus is the head. We are the body. So he has this wonderful, uh, uh, he didn't think it was wonderful at that point in time when he gets knocked off his horse, confronted with Jesus, the next three days he's blind. He is not thinking that this is a great turning point in his life. But it turned out to be. It was a radical change in Paul's in Saul's life. He was still Saul then. And, and so Jesus said in John chapter 3 with uh, Nicodemus, he says, you've got to be born again. And being born again is so much more than a bunch of rules to adhere to. You see, if, if you can get born again and saved from rules, Saul would have been saved. He had the rules down, he knew the book, he knew the law, he knew it all. He had it down. But he was lost and angry and a bitter soul. It took a radical transformation to change him. When we come to Christ, we're not just looking to be a little bit better, a little bit nicer, you know, the kinder, gentler Dennis, now that he's saved. We're looking to be radically changed and transformed. May I ask, do you feel that you've been radically changed and transformed? Me, it didn't happen like, like, like Saul. Falling off the uh, horse, dramatic encounter. I've had a radical transformation, but it's taken me, good grief, 45 years to, pull, to, uh, to see it take place. Some of us are just, I've known people that get saved, and it's just like that. And I know people like me that it's a gradual thing. It's day by day you, you walk with Jesus, you serve him, you allow him to mold and shape you. We want to have a dramatic change in our lives, and that's what happened to Saul. So much so that he even changed his name from Saul to Paul. He went from hell-bent to heaven-straightened. He went from a hater of Jesus to a lover of Jesus. Uh, can you think of anybody that you know that just hates the church, hates Jesus, hates Christians? Those people are perfect candidates for radical transformation. And, and if you know people like that, pray for them. Lord, they, they just need an encounter. They didn't encounter like I had, an encounter like Paul had. And it changes everything. Paul went from trying to destroy the church to building the church. In fact, he gave his whole life from then on that all the world would know about Jesus. Remember, he was going with murder in his heart to Damascus to get after those that followed Jesus. And after that change, 
he gave his life that the world might know Jesus. He was probably the greatest missionary that there ever was. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, you don't have to turn to it. This became his life, as it were, life verse, his life motto, which was, for me to live as Christ, to die gain. How many people are like that, I wonder? All that matters to me is living for Jesus. This is what happened with Paul, and I'm praying. I would ask you to join with me, not just to pray for me, but yourself. God, may I have such an encounter with you that that would become mo the motto of my life? For me to live is Christ, to die again. That's all he cared about. That is just amazing. So from a prison cell in Rome, and you would... You would never realize this. He wrote Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon from a prison cell. That's an absolutely amazing thing. We get some of the backstory of the book of, of Ephesians in Acts chapter 18 and 19. You see in chapter 18 of the book of Acts, he originally just passes through Ephesus. He doesn't stop. But we read that around the year 55 A.D., if you want some context, that's about 26 years after Jesus died. Think about those of us who are older. 26 years wasn't that long ago. But in 55 A.D., he established the church at Ephesus, and he ministered there for two years. Those folks must have just loved it, having him there, the apostle there for two years. May I just put a footnote here? We've had a, an apostle here for over 40 years. We are the most fortunate of people. And may I say, and may I encourage you to, not only yourself, but to encourage others that every time we have a service, come expecting to receive. Especially when, when any of the pastors speak, because we, we, we share and we speak under the umbrella of, the, of our apostle, but especially when he comes and shares. In fact, I want... For you, you're going to have to look at, our, at the church calendar. I can never get the dates right. It's in, it's in April. We have our, our RIM conference this year. April 6th, Saturday, April 6th. Begin to mark that down, set that aside. Don't let that take you back there's, uh, away from that because there's such vision, such anointing, such teaching that goes on. And it's my prayer, and I was praying tonight, this place would just be exploding, uh, so filled with people. But we have such a privilege to have him here. In verse 1 of chapter 1 of Ephesians 1, Paul shares his credentials. He says that, that, that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. What is an apostle? An apostle is one whose ministry is translocal. It's not just in one place. It extends over many lo different locations and areas. He is one who goes out and establishes. You know, I... Uh, years ago, I would think, you know, I'd love to be an apostle because what they build lasts. I want to build stuff that lasts. So, so he, an apostle goes out, he establishes. He, an apostle is the final authority in church disputes. Oftentimes, churches blow up when there's arguments, fighting, different things, different opinions, because there's not an apostle to put things in order. Apostles put things in order. An apostle will lead and guide and correct and establish not only churches, but also church leaders and church governments. Apostles establish some pretty heavy-duty things. I've been saying he, but I just wanted to want to say also, uh, uh, we believe it's scriptural that an apostle can also be a woman. Not everyone in the uh, body of Christ agrees with that, uh, but we, we can prove that from scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul writes a little bit later, he writes, And he himself, meaning Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So Paul makes it clear in verse 1 of Ephesians 1 and in, in chapter uh, 4, verse 11 of Ephesians, he makes it very clear that it is God who establishes church leadership. In other words, if we could break it down to the, the apostolic, no one just decides they're going to be an apostle. No one comes up to someone and says, hey, 
I'm an apostle, here's my card. You've got to acknowledge that. It is a, a position, the apostolic is a position that God appoints. And he appoints those things that the church would be built up and blessed. We, uh, we have an apostle with Apostle Dave, but you know, he never called himself an apostle. I, I, I and Lori have known Apostle Dave, Pastor Vivian, for uh, 44, 44 years, since we were all really quite young. And he never wanted to be have a designation of apostle on his life because he knew the cost of what those things would be. The cost of misunderstanding, the cost of slander, the, these types of things. But he allowed the recognition of what God had already stamped in his life that is seen through, throughout our churches, seen throughout the churches overseas. So much so, pastors in Africa were going, why, why, why are you not acknowledging this? And finally, just give you a little bit of background, the RIM Council said it's, it's time. And reluctantly, he allowed it to take place. Remember, we had a service in 2008 at Desert Christian Center where we recognized what already was there. We didn't say, now you're an apostle. We just said, we recognize, oh God, what you have done. Though the apostle is a position of authority and and the apostle is the highest authority, looking at Ephesians 4, uh, verse 11. Paul made it real clear that if you're not an apostle, you best leave it alone. In describing what it was like to be an apostle, he writes in, uh, to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 4, 9 through 13. He said, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to the angels and to men. Now, this is the top rung of church leadership. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but he writes to the church in Corinth, but, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. May I ask, how many want to be an apostle? If God hasn't called you to these things, just leave it alone. Why, why go through those things? Verse 13, he says, being defamed, we entreat. We've been made... Now, now, listen to this. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. I thought about that word offscouring. Uh, I was going to say, uh, those of you that were here for the Christmas Eve service, I was going to say when I got up, hey, we almost burned down our house tonight. What did you guys do? Uh, because our, our, our daughter was uh, uh, at the house, Becky, and she was making... Uh, making apple pies for uh, a Christmas the next day for when our family's together. And uh, if you haven't had one of her apple pies, be sure to be here for the next holiday dinner. She normally makes a couple for them. They're, they're, I love them. I'm sorry, just give me a moment. But, but they, they really are wonderful. Um, but anyhow, so she's, she's baking a pie or two in, in our oven, and, and uh, she has it, I think, on a cookie sheet. And... And it kind of spilled over and went over on the stove, and all of a sudden there's smoke and there's flames. And uh, fortunately, our, our eldest daughter Holly was there, and she had the I don't know I don't know how she put it out. Was it a fire extinguisher? What was it? Oh, baking soda. Great. She she did baking soda, she, but she got it she got it out. The pie was safe. But the pan, the pan was less than desirable. And so when it was all over, I took the pan, I, I took it in the sink outside in the, in the garage and, and uh, uh, getting it, you know, hot with water and stuff. And I, and I got a, uh, a metal spatula, and I'm scraping the black, the crud, off of this thing. That's off scouring. That's just the stuff you want to scrape off, you want to get rid of. And Paul says, that's what it's like to be an apostle. I've been very close to the one we have. It's not always a picnic by any stretch. I was around a group of people years ago who were pressing to be pastors. Uh, 
though it was pretty clear they weren't called. But boy, they wanted, and, and I think, I don't mean to be unkind, but I think they wanted the title, the recognition. They did not have the gifting. And I, I was just a really young man then, and, and I'd been in, in ministry and, and around others in ministry, and I wondered, why do you want this so bad? And all I could think was, uh, enjoy life. Why do this to yourself? If you're not called to these things, uh, don't do it. Don't try to push for something. Because here's the thing. If you have gifts, God will raise you up. Pure and simple. No man can keep you down. If, if you have gifts and you aren't being recognized as, they, as you think that you should be, lay down your gifts at the feet of Jesus. Because if you start pushing for your gifts, I tell you what, you're going down a, down a path that could be very, very destructive to you and to others. If you feel that Jesus has a ministry for you and it's not being recognized, whatever you do, don't run somewhere else. See, because you can always find a place that will give you the platform you think you deserve. You can always find it. But if it's not the place God designed you for, the place where he designed you to be planted, it will destroy and dis disillusion you. Trust God. I wish I could share this with a much greater group of people. When you try to push something that you think that you're something and people just aren't recognizing it, the pastor's just not giving me a shot. You're not giving me a place. Maybe it's not time. Or if I could be so harsh, maybe you're not all that. There's a place for each person in the body of Christ. There's a place he's given each one of us gifts and callings that are specific. Well, I don't want that. I want to do that. Do what he's given you to do. It will cause you to be the most fulfilled. Don't hold back no matter what. Trust God. Because at the right time, he'll lift you up. I, it, it reminded me of a story. I, I've told you this before, but uh, at New Beginnings Church in Colorado Springs, big church, pastored by a fellow named Brady Boyd. And when this church was first starting in the founder's home of that church, I mean, now it's just like this mega church. They got six campuses and, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a happening place. But it started in the founding pastor's basement. And, and they're meeting together. And they had a worship leader, uh, uh, and I believe it was a guitar player, and uh, uh, really anointed, really anointed worship leader. But he was a flake. Uh, you know, I wasn't always on time. He wasn't always prompt. He wasn't always dependable. Man, when he started playing and singing, the heavens opened up. And one day he comes to the pastor and he says, Pastor, God's told me I'm supposed to be the worship leader of a big church, not a little church like this. So I'm leaving. And he left. And he had heard right. God wanted him to be the worship leader of a big church. That was going to become a huge church. But, you know, in the process, God was wanting to mold and shape him and bring maturity to him, things he did not have. But he ran, chasing the carrot, instead of listening to what God was saying and following God's plan. What, a, what is God saying to each one of you today? What is he saying? What is he calling you to? What are the things, what are the dreams in your heart? Things that you see, things that, that you, want to be, you want to do, you want to be a part of. Say, God, I, I long for this. Something just bursts in me. Grow in Christ. Grow and mature. Be in the word of God. Seek to grow, worship, and trust him to bring it about. Please, if ever you hear pastors just don't, don't see the good that's in me. Uh, let that one go, because that's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay? Back to verse 1. He writes, To the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You probably know this, but what is a saint? It is not, I'll tell you what it's not, it's not some over-the-top remarkable Christian guy who walks on water, walks about an inch off the ground, they're always kind of looking in the distance because they see something. It, it, it isn't that. They're just 
Saints are just regular, I call them Joe and Joannas. They're, they're just regular people who love Jesus and are faithful to him. Do we have any saints here in the building today? It's not a trick question. God calls all of us saints. So right out of the box in this scripture, Paul exemplifies an important point to us. He writes to the church in Ephesus, he says, grace and peace to you. Now you have to see he's being, he's, he's writing from prison, he's imprisoned unjustly, and, and even though the outcome of his imprisonment is unsure at that point, he opens his remarks with blessing on his hearers. What comes out of our mouths is our choice. It isn't dependent upon our circumstances, but upon the choice that we make. We can bless or we can curse. We can choose to lift others up or we can choose to complain. Paul always had a choice and he chose to speak words of grace and peace. Don't you just love being around people like that? I mean, do you like being around people that always complain? No, but you love to be around people who've got a good word, have got, got, just got grace and peace all over them, and they speak it out of their lips. That's one of the reasons that we love Dick Mills so much. You know, he said he wasn't a prophet. What did he call himself, John? An encourager of the body. That's how he referred to himself. Well, I don't see that in the scriptures anywhere. Well, you don't need to. Paul, though he's an apostle, was an encourager of the body to this day. He's encouraging us. Dick Mills always encouraged me. I just remember, you know, always, I've got a good word for you. Okay, I'll take that. I mean, as opposed to a bad word, I'll take a good word anytime. And he always had something of the goodness of the Lord to share with you that gave you hope. He was, what was the last time he was here? I don't know if he'd hit 90 yet or well up into his 80s. Uh, but he was ministering to, he wanted to minister to the young people at the end of a service. And it isn't like you had to take the kids and just go, go on, go on, up there. They, they rush to him. There's something that is drawing about a person who has a good word on their lips. I, I think of, of uh, our sister, Nancy Williams. Nancy, uh, uh, who here just very shortly will, will uh, be enjoying heaven for the last seven years. Uh, and she was, as she was fighting cancer, and that is really not no fun. Chemo is no fun. Uh, cancer is no fun. Um, and you'd come up to her on a sunny morning and you want to get out of your lips, Nancy, it's so good to see you. How are you? But before you can, she would say, how are you? With that smile on her face. Though her circumstances were grim, you could never tell from her voice. She was always asking, how are you? I, I ask myself, isn't this the kind of people we want to be? Uh, I don't want to be complaining. I want to be encouraging people. I want a good word out of my lips that will that will release grace and peace into their lives. So that when they walk away from us, they don't feel like washing their hands, but they feel like, I needed that. And, and every one of us in the room have that potential to be those people. And I'm looking around that, this room and I'm going, you are those people. May we infect others with that. Jesus said that out of the treasure of our hearts, the mouth speaks. What's deep inside is what comes out of it. I've heard guys in the past, after they'd say some, well, really, that's not my heart. Really, it is. That's what comes out of our lips, is what's down deep in here. If we have trouble with what's coming out of here, then we just gotta, gotta ask, Lord, Lord, touch my heart. You see, because I, I, I think that a good barometer of our hearts and our spiritual condition is our lips. We can see how we are by what we say. How about this one, when things go wrong? I, I remember hearing folks so oftentimes say, I just can't take one more thing. This is just the last straw, I can't take one more thing. It, it's it's a, a picture of the condition of their heart. 
There's, there's no faith in there. When out of our lips has got to come faith. Now, I, 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 I'm like you. I, I fight to do that sometimes. I'm not always perfect in it. But I try to grab a hold quickly, and I have to remember what Scripture says. God says, don't worry. God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lay hold of that. You said you'll meet my every need. You know that, that scripture, my, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory, comes in on the heels of, of scriptures on giving. So being recipients of all of our needs met means that we're obedient as he speaks to us about giving. Those things are, are connected. But we've got to speak the truth of scripture. That's got to come out of our lips. Uh, and, and may God touch our hearts. How did Paul get his lips right? Again, he got his heart right. He spent time with Jesus regularly, and we'll see in the upcoming verses as we continue uh, on other, other nights, he took his eyes off himself, and he prayed earnestly for others. If you read in the book of Acts when he's on a, uh, he's on a ship, he's in, uh, he's in chains, they're, they're taking him to Rome, the ship is shouldn't have gone at the wrong time of year. Uh, they're getting shipwrecked and stuff. Uh, the 14 days had gone, gone on. The crew hadn't eaten. They'd been in a storm. And he's telling my angel came last night, spoke to me, and he said, he's given me all of your lives. He's praying for them. He's in, now, now, let me tell you, you guys, go, go ahead and have something to eat. You're going you're gonna to be fine. We're going to lose the ship. You guys are all going to live. My goodness. Unjustly in prison, on his way to trial in Rome. He has an encounter with God and he's encouraging people. You know, most people would say, hope you all drowned. But, but, but he wasn't that way because something had grabbed a hold of his heart and he was because of that he took his eyes off of himself, his condition, and he was concerned like Nancy. Hi, how are you doing? That's a genuine thing that God wants to put in our hearts. So what does tonight's study say to us? So we're, we're going to wrap up here. I, I, I want to encourage you next week, we'll at least cover double the ground that we covered tonight in Ephesians because we only covered verse 1 and 2 of chapter 1. But, but, but we will cover more next week. What, what does the study say to us? Let me give you the, 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 the main points for tonight. From what we talked about, I, I would love to put together a PowerPoint. I didn't get time to do that. Point number one, we have to let Jesus get his hands on us. It'll lead to a radical transformation. I, I am nothing like I was when I gave my life to Jesus. But I am not content. I do not want to stay here. I want to encourage you. Press forward. Press, as you read the Word of God daily, and I encourage you with our Bible calendars, read daily. Pray as you read. God, I want this. Scripture, as we're reading in Genesis, talks about Abraham, and, and he believed God, and, and, and God said, because of that, I declare you to be righteous. You read that stuff, you go, God, help me to believe you. Help me just to believe you. When you think of the God of the universe who could do anything, and he makes promises, and we doubt we have such an ear to hear what Satan is saying. We've got to tune our ears to hear what God is saying. Let Jesus get his hands on you. Number two, our whole purpose for living should be Jesus. Just Jesus. That confronts some things in me. I ask myself, how does my whole life, purpose being about Jesus, how does that how does it equate that I want to hop on my motorcycle and go for a ride? Well, I'm not really sure. I try to convince Lori that it's ministry. But, uh, uh, and there are opportunities I get on the road. But, but how do you, you know, put all those things together, the things you like to do? I think we can do lots of things that if in the midst of those things, Jesus is foremost in our hearts and lives. He's the most important thing. God, help us to grow in that. Number three, you can't separate Jesus from his church. 
I love Jesus. Can't stand you. Okay, there's something that's wrong with that. Number four, God will give you gifts and grow you. If tonight you're sitting there going, I don't know what my gifts are. Ask him to show you. Pastor, can you show me what my gifts are? Well, I might be able to it, I might not. I might just not, flatten, might not know. Number five, grow where you are planted. Don't look for another place. Unless God is calling you somewhere. And then if he's calling you somewhere, uh, get together with your pastors. Could, be, could you just pray with me? Well, well, they'll never agree to this. They just want you to stay. If, if you don't trust your pastors in such a small area, you're, you're probably in the wrong church. You need to find a pastor you can trust. The next one, I've lost track of what number it is. Six, because I used letters. <laughs> You're a saint. Don't ever use this, well, you know, well, I'm no saint. Well, I just read that you are. So you may not feel like a saint. If you don't feel like a saint, then you've got to figure out what's wrong. And if you don't feel like a saint, you've got to go with what you know and what God said. He says you are. So if there's a discrepancy between who you are and what that saint is, Talk to Jesus, talk to one of your pastors, talk to one of the, letter, the, the leaders. Let's get this thing squared away. Number seven. Uh, a good indicator of our spiritual condition is what comes out of our mouths. May, may we be like Isaiah who recognized this when he's standing in the very presence of God. He said, God, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Woe is me. And an angel takes a coal from the, from the altar of God, puts it on his lips. God says, there, I cleaned him up. God can clean up your lips, but let him go deeper and touch your heart. Lastly, connected to the, the one we just talked about, spending time with Jesus will keep our hearts right. That's the only thing that, that keeps me from becoming I don't know, the scum of the earth, a Neanderthal, is, is spending time with Jesus. It, it changes me. When I don't, I, I, I begin to feel cold and lifeless. I said lastly on that one, but I was just kidding. Um, lastly, I, and you'll see the scripture behind me, Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. If I can leave you with one thing tonight, seek the Lord while he may be found. When can he be found? Right now. Right now. When you wake up in the morning, he will be able to be found if you search for him. He'll be able to be found. How, how hard do you have to search? You open up the word of God and you say, God, I, I want to hear what you're saying. Speak to me today, oh God. And he'll do that. Amen. This is a uh, uh, first uh, foray into the book of Ephesians. We'll continue in chapter one next week. We'll see how far we get, but I promise you at least double the amount of the scriptures that we did tonight. So, uh, so to give you great hope. So let's stand and pray together. I'm so, I'm so grateful to all of you for brave, braving uh, the weather tonight. Uh, Tom was hearing the rain. I had to listen hard, but I, I think he was right. I don't know if it's still raining or not. We have the drawbridge across the moat out there. Um, if um, some of the guys could just kind of uh, help the ladies uh, uh, across so we don't have anybody, uh, you know, taking a dive into the drink uh, or anything like that tonight. Father God, we, we do just want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, that you are good and your mercies do endure forever. We thank you for the word of God that transforms and changes us, Lord God. And I, and I pray tonight, Lord God, that there would be a new commitment in our lives to seeking you with all of our hearts, that you might reach in and change our hearts 
Change what comes out of our lips. Change our thinking, oh God, that we might be more and more like you. Father, I pray this week you would change our vocabulary vocabulary so that what comes out of our lips are words of grace and peace, our words encourage and lift up. Father, provide miracles today, uh, this week, Lord God, even today. Father, hear our prayers as we pray in different areas, Lord God. We pray that you would move, Lord. Father, I pray for this congregation, for all the things that they are praying for, the places they need help, places they need your intervention. Lord, would you hear, would you answer their prayers and move miraculously, we pray. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and please drive safely home tonight.